Hello and welcome to a brand new series called Wild Watch Out of Africa with me, Chris Packham. Now we've left the shores of the south of England firmly behind and travelled to Kenya to meet a few of Africa's biggest and boldest animals. But we'll also be looking at a few of the smaller species, the kind of things that tourists normally overlook. Well our programme this week is absolutely packed, we don't want to waste any time. So without further ado, let's see what's coming up in the next few weeks. On Wild Encounters, I'll be crossing both land and water in search of Africa's most exciting animals. Whether it's bad-tempered black rhino or flamboyant flamingos, I'm guaranteed to be nose-to-nose -nose with nature. In Animal Orphans, I'll be visiting rehabilitation and reintroduction centres, which are dedicated to looking after the not-so-lucky African animals who need a little helping hand. On Safari Specials, I'll be in search of the Big Five, but taking a few rather unorthodox methods to find them. And finally, I'll be meeting the locals in It's a Wild Life as they work, rest and play alongside the wealth of wildlife that lives here in Kenya. But now, because in my less than humble and ever adamant opinion, the best things in life are birds, that's where we're going to start with our very first wild encounter. This is the one I've been waiting for, a day's birding in Kenya. Now there are about seven or eight hundred species to be found here. I've literally only just come out of my hotel and already seen 30 or 40. Brilliant. Like most of the wildlife here in Kenya, bold is definitely better. And that's certainly the case when it comes to birds. Just look at these superb starlings, living up to their name. But what I'm after this morning is an ornithological experience with an expert angler. Well, the general gist is that at 8 o'clock in the morning, we're in the middle of Lake Baringo, and we're going to try and throw a fish out to lure an African fish eagle in. And the fish have balsa wood pushed into them so that they float on the surface and don't sink. And all we've got to hope is that the eagle is hungry. Now, these eagles occur all over Africa. I suppose they kind of do the job of our osprey. They feed on small fish, but they're also scavengers, and you'll see them along shorelines picking up any, anything that's left there. A striking bird, too, with a chestnut back and a gleaming white head. Should be great if it comes down. Come on. <laughs> Fantastic. When it came in, it was absolutely hunkered down like that, looking really hard. The poor fish didn't have a chance. Look at that. Well, that was absolutely fantastic, but apparently there's another treat in store, the world's biggest heron. Superb. It's a beautiful looking bird, but also it's the largest heron in the world. Goliath heron, living up to its name. It's massive, massive, about double the size of our grey herons. Look at that. You can see the fish in its throat. Well, swooping eagles and the world's biggest heron are pretty good, but Kenya has got more to offer when it comes to bird spectacles. Now, on their own, Flamingos are quite gangly, ungainly birds. Long, thin legs, their beaks are upside down. Beady little eyes, you know, the sort of thing that you'd hold upside down and hit hedgehogs with if you were in Alice in Wonderland. But when you get a million of them together in one place, they transform themselves into the greatest ornithological spectacle in the world. Just look at that colour. Just listen to this sound. It is just simply staggering, for me at least, probably the greatest sight on earth. 
a wall of pink that stretches from one horizon to the other. These birds have all come here to feed, and they feed on microscopic algae, which they glean by using their tongue to pump water coming in through the sides of their bills through a complex series of combs, so effectively they're straining the water. Because each food item is so infinitesimally small, they have to feed nearly all day just to get enough energy to keep going. Now the one extraordinary thing about this place is that the water in that lake is so alkaline that it's caustic. If I were to swim in it, it would literally strip the skin from my bones. And yet these birds are able to walk in it all day, unless they get a little nick on their leg. And then sadly, within three or four days, they perish. Now it must be said that I'm not often lost for words, but wow. This is, for me, ornithological nirvana. I mean, I simply do not know what I'm going to do next. Can I go down the park and look at seagulls? No. Well, look, if the candy pink of those flamingos was just too gaudy for you, how about the flamboyance of these things? These are crested or crowned cranes. And if you ask me, they're pretty special. I've always had a thing about cranes. They remind me of elegant 1950s women, people like Audrey Hepburn, dressed in Chanel. And I've often fantasised about taking one to the Ritz. And on that absurd note, I think we'd better move on. If you want to see more exotic birds and you don't want to travel so far from home, then try Bird World in Surrey or Amazon World on the Isle of Wight. And if it's raptors that you're after, then the Hawk Conservancy in Hampshire or Eagle Heights in Kent would be the place to visit. But now, it's time for some monkey business in Animal Orphans. Sunrise over Africa, and it's an early start. This morning, I'm off to see an animal that's not actually native to Kenya, but has become extremely threatened in the wild. So this is one of the few places in the world where it's got a safe haven from poachers. I'm joining Annie Oliver Kona, who runs the Sweetwaters Chimp Sanctuary, home for abandoned and orphaned animals who have been affected by wildlife crimes. Annie, chimpanzees are always in the top ten of everyone's favourite animal. If they're not number one, they're always close to it. Why do you think they have such an enduring appeal to people? I think it's because they're so much like us and people see themselves in them. Despite the fact that they're one of our favourite animals, they are severely threatened. Um, loss of habitat is one thing, but what else is worrying in terms of their conservation? One of the big problems is that they're being hunted for the meat. and That's turned a very commercial. They go out and they hunt a whole family of chimpanzees. The baby is not worth the meat price. It's so small. Uh, so they keep it alive and try to sell it alive on the black market, either if they can export it abroad or to local people to keep us a pet. So all these chimps, they've been picked up from market or vendors or they have been confiscated in private homes from people that's kept them illegally. Tell me a bit about the sanctuary here at Sweetwaters, its origins and of course its objectives. The reason really why they built a sanctuary here in Kenya was that to get people to realise the problems that the chimps are facing in the wild. Uh, there are lots of chimpanzee sanctuaries in the countries where they come from, like Cameroon, Congo, Gabon, etc. But people don't exactly go there on holiday. And we needed to spread the word out to the Western world. And Kenya is um, a tourist country and therefore it was decided to put a sanctuary here. One of the unique things is that they've got so much space here. We're lucky in that respect. We've got two enclosures on each side of the river. The river is the dividing point. And they don't cross the river, do they? No, they, they don't swim. <laughs> they don't mind the water. Mind you, when the tree falls over, that's a good bridge, so we have to cut them down. And you put a tremendous amount of effort into looking after these animals. What's the reward? The reward is to see that the chimps develop into being chimpanzees rather than semi-human beings and that they can live a chimpanzee life with the social behavior that they should have in the groups. That to us is the reward. Do 
they come to this spot every morning? Um, just about, <laughs> because we scatter food around here and you know that. What do they get? A variation, it's a mixture of vegetables and uh, fruit, depending on what the season is. I'm going to sit down and just take a look at them if that's all right. They are one of those creatures you need to watch to learn about, aren't they? They definitely are. You have to do that. You have to sit down and look at them. <laughs> OK. This is an extraordinary opportunity to sit only 20 metres away from a group of chimpanzees and enjoy their behaviour, learn a bit about them. But you know, they're so close to us, so similar in their anatomy and their behaviour that I personally can't help find that a bit threatening, a bit uncomfortable. These are my relatives. Welcome back to Wild Watch Out of Africa with me, Chris Packham. Now, for the next few weeks, we're leaving the best of British behind, all its bats and badgers, and we come here to Kenya to look at some of the planet's most fantastic wildlife, things like these African elephants. But sadly, we're going to have to leave them behind too, because it's time for our safari special. This week, I'm going on a safari with a difference, a suburban safari here in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. Now, when people here say that it's a jungle out there, they really mean it. This is an extraordinary sight. A real vision of century 21. Behind me, a couple of ancient animals, a pale rhino, a cow and her calf, and behind them, the skyscrapers of modern Nairobi. Now, I kind of like the contrast between the wild and the man-made structures there. But then again, it would have been nice to have been here in the 1920s, when Nairobi would have just been a couple of hotels and a railway station. You know, it really is quite incongruous. I'm looking out here, and I can see wildebeest and zebra wandering around in front of Nairobi's second airport with lots of light aircraft taking off. There's such a diversity of wildlife literally right here on the doorstep. How about this for a morning's birding? Not often you get to go out and see the world's largest bird. Here are a group of female or young ostrich. They're picking very delicately at some seeds, I presume, or maybe the leaves on these bushes here. Extraordinary birds. Well, hardly birds at all, really. They always strike me as being more mammalian. This is actually quite a small herd of buffalo. Sometimes they number what, many thousands. Now in many places, you'll only see them in great numbers at night. In the day, they remain very cautious. They're frequently predated by lions and they spend most of their time hiding in thick cover. And you can judge by their bolt that they need to spend a lot of time grazing. They get to be very, very heavy animals. The big males nudging a ton. The span of their horns can also reach up to about 1.75 2 metres. That's six old fashioned feet. Along with hippos, buffalo are often known as the most dangerous animals in Africa, simply because people who are following their game trails through the thick bush stumble across them, perhaps cows with a calf or one of the grouchy old bulls. And of course, if one of these things charges you, you're in big trouble. Now you can see some pretty gruesome things in many of the world's capital cities, but you're not going to top that. This lioness is just finishing her breakfast on wildebeest. The whole group of them here have had a, a bit of a fest, and there are in fact several carcasses here which these lions have been feeding on. Most of them have finished. I mean, look at that one over there. It's got a massively fat stomach, and all it can do is sleep it off, snoozing away. 
But in the meantime, she just can't resist a few more morsels. Just look at that. See the bone on the wildebeest's leg there. She's just trying to strip the last piece of flesh off. One thing's for sure, there's probably no greater place where you can appreciate the fact that death is essential to life, especially here out on these plains. I mean, the wildebeest probably wouldn't agree, not at this stage, but then the lion certainly would. Now, Nairobi National Park is certainly not top of the pops when it comes to wilderness experiences. It's not the Masai Mara, it's not Nakuru or Amboseli, but nevertheless, it's extremely accessible. And you can pop out from your hotel and see a wealth of wildlife in a couple of hours. So really, you just can't beat it. Now, Nairobi National Park here might seem a world away from the south of England, simply because it is, but it's right alongside the capital city of Kenya. So in a way, there are plenty of parallels to places like the New Forest in Hampshire, which is close to Bournemouth, Pool and Southampton. But of course, as soon as you get here, the contrast becomes extremely striking. In the south coast of England, our biggest predator is the fox, and here, it's the lion. And just look at this huge chap behind me who's completely gorged himself. And he's doing what lions always do once they're fed, sleep it off. Now, each week I'm going to be meeting a Kenyan individual who's devoted a lot of their time to protecting the animals here. Today, it's Rick Anderson, who's very keen on his giraffes. Now, it's not every day you get to take breakfast with an exotic species but today is a special treat. I'm here at Giraffe Manor, just outside Nairobi, Kenya's capital, and this is Lynn, a three-year-old Rothschild giraffe. And every morning, when you're a guest at the house here, you have to share your breakfast with these animals. Thankfully, they don't like the toast, which is just as well, because I'm quite peckish myself. And they have their own special giraffe nuts. Now, let's have a look at that tongue. My mother would probably question the hygiene of this event, but, you know, I think it's worth putting up with a bit of saliva for a treat like this. OK. I don't know how am I going to eat my toast. Ah, oh, that's giraffe saliva, isn't it? The Anderson family who live here have had a long history with Rothschild giraffe. Betty first rescued five of these animals in the mid-70s when she saw this subspecies becoming critically endangered in Kenya. When Betty died in 1995, her son Rick took over as guardian, and since then his bond with the giraffes has been just as strong. He opened his home to the general public 15 years ago with the main aim of promoting conservation to tourist and local school children. I dropped in to meet him. Rick, what's so special about Rothschild's giraffe? Well, their specialty really is their rareness. Uh, they are one of nine subspecies in Africa. There are three here in East Africa, but the Rothschild subspecies were in Western Kenya, which is heavily populated and, and arable. And uh, the population was taking away their habitats, and there were only 130 left on one 18,000 acre cattle ranch. The story is much uh, better today, though, isn't it? So, what, how has you know, the Giraffe Centre here help? you know, reverse the trend. Uh, over the years, my parents were able to raise funds to have breeding groups move from this in one endangered area to five different safe areas, and now there are about 300. I think a lot of people perceive that African kids grow up with the game, but I mean, that's just not the case these days. Many of them live in cities or in suburbia. Very much so, especially today. A hundred years ago, uh, wildlife controlled 90% of the area and, and people 10, and, and in the last hundred years, it's completely reversed. Uh, and people in the cities obviously don't see them. The Nairobi National Park here, you need to have a vehicle to, to be able to drive in, and most Kenyans can't afford uh, vehicles to drive in. The ones that live out in the tea areas and the coffee areas, the game has been moved out of those areas a long, a long time ago. It's really only the pastoralist tribes, the Maasai and the Samburu of the north, that see game. And how do these kids respond to seeing the animals? I mean, are they terribly excited? If I ever have a late morning sleep, I could get woken up by them laughing and screaming and shouting down here. It's quite an experience because a lot of the kids do come from the slums. Uh, we have a program to bring the poor kids out here in buses. They don't have transportation. And these kids haven't seen trees, much less animals. Rick, what is it about giraffes that you, know, that you think that grabs people? I and mean, what is it personally that you find so exciting about these animals? 
mainly I think it is their beauty and their uniqueness as well as their, their character. They're, all, they're gentle giants. Where can you find an animal that weighs a ton and a half that comes and eats out of your hand and you don't have to be worried about being eaten? Can you imagine life without giraffes? I mean, they play a great role in it on a day-to-day -day basis. I would hate to have to think about life without a giraffe. I am, as I say, half of my life have been on this property with giraffes, so it's to live someplace else without giraffe would be awful. You know, when I was five or six years old, I used to beg my mother on an almost daily basis to take me to Southampton City Zoo. And one of my earliest memories was of a giraffe reaching down over the top of its cage and licking me with its long purple tongue. And since then, I've been fortunate to encounter them in all sorts of places, but never anything like this. Because here, the giraffes are against the backdrop of Africa. Those acacia trees, and I can hear the twitter of the local birds. What a wonderful experience. Worth waiting about 33 years for. <laughs>